from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Rafael P. Roman. Tonight, summer in the city and the parks are feeling the heat. The city and state have cut parks funding in ways that are unacceptable over the last few years. Political power shifts on both sides of the Hudson River. It's a glorious time to be following politics. The village through the centuries. In the years leading up to World War I, it bloomed as, as an art neighborhood and as a bohemian neighborhood. And art from upstate. Funding for this program is made possible by James and Merrill Tisch. Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Jody and John Arnhold, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the Nissan Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company. Hello, I'm Rafael Piroman. Welcome to Metro Focus. Summer in the city means it's time to head for the parks. But are all parks equal? Democratic State Senator Daniel Squadron says no. And in a minute, we'll hear about his new proposal to move money from some of the better funded parks to those in lower income neighborhoods. In some ways, New York is a city of parks, with over 1,700 recreation areas, playgrounds, pools, and parks spread over 29,000 acres and five boroughs. To maintain them, the city spends close to $305 million a year. That's a lot of money, but it's actually less than half a percent of the total city budget for last year. Most parks can't manage on public funds alone, so some like the High Line, an old elevated freight line on the west side of Manhattan, and Prospect Park, a 585-acre oasis in Brooklyn, have turned to conservancies and private donors to bridge their funding gaps. Central Park is operated in partnership with the Central Park Conservancy, a private group that raises 85 percent of the park's annual budget. In less affluent neighborhoods, public parks often struggle just to keep up with maintenance and repairs. And that's what's driving Senator Squadron's call for a new neighborhood parks alliance, an alliance that he says will help level the playing field across the city park system. And joining me now is the author of the new plan to share money raised for the well-funded parks with those that are struggling, Democratic State Senator Daniel Squadron. Senator, welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, Senator, uh, first of all, just how bad is the situation in these underfunded parks. Could you give us concrete examples? Sure. Look, there are 1,700 parks in the city, and lots of them. Uh, parks like St. Mary's in the South Bronx, and even Flushing Meadows Corona Park, the former home of the World's Fair in Queens, Sarah Roosevelt Park in uh, the Chinatown neighborhood in my district, uh, where you see uh, in St. Mary's, for example, tennis court that isn't a tennis court anymore. It has no net. It's cracked asphalt. Uh, bleachers that aren't bleachers anymore because they have no seats. Uh, a field that has no grass. In Flushing Meadows Corona, you see uh, graffiti that uh, is persistent. You see litter in the corner of uh, pieces of the park. Where there should be grass, there's dust. So how will your proposal change that? What is your proposal? Uh, look, my proposal is uh, that because we have some parks, uh, some of the marquee parks in the system, Central Park, Prospect Park, and others, that are doing better than ever thanks to the generosity of conservancies that essentially fund uh, large portions of their budget, we should take 20% of the operating budgets of those well-funded conservancies for those jewels in the system and uh, get that 20% to parks in need across the city. Create a partnership between those parks in need who aren't getting enough city and state funding and those parks that also aren't getting enough city and state funding but whose conservancies are changing the equation. Would these 20% from the conservancies to the member parks be voluntary or, or will it be mandated by law? Uh, look, I put in legislation that would make this a requirement. Our hope is uh, we're not talking about that many well-funded conservancies mm -hmm. uh, that folks would step up and uh, be interested in uh, being part of this voluntarily, but my legislation would require it. But Senator, you know, most people who contribute their own money to a cause that they believe in want 100% of that money to go to their cause. They don't want the government to come in and take 20% and give it to somebody else. Aren't you concerned that your proposal will reduce uh, the amount of money uh, that 
go to parks by private donors, therefore hurting all parks? Uh, look, you know, I don't. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is the conservancy is still going to be the best way to support Central Park if you like it. The other is, you know, my belief is a lot of the folks funding these conservancies, they believe in their local park. Mm -hmm. They also believe in parks overall. They know that uh, the kids in neighborhoods like the South Bronx who don't have anywhere to go on hot summer weekends, don't have any other options, need better parks. And so it's actually a great opportunity both to fund uh, Central Park, Prospect Park, keep these parks world class, and also at the same time know that your dollars are going to a good place to help kids mm. in need and neighborhoods in need. But you know, Senator, it's not as if Central Park or Prospect Park, who have big donations by conservancies or private donors, it's not like these are exclusively for the for the rich of New York City. All New Yorkers, as you well know, you know, patronize these parks. So isn't it in a way uh, taking from Peter to give to Peter? Uh, no, because uh, first of all, these parks should be great. I support the fact that they're doing as well mm. as they are. Uh, you have 1,700 parks in the system. Mm -hmm. You have five, six, maybe seven conservancies with operating budgets over $5 million mm -hmm. a year. Uh, which you're still at 80%, you're still doing a great job with these mm -hmm. parks. You know, there's something else here, <laughs> which is the city and state have cut parks funding in ways right. that are unacceptable over the right. last few years. And for large parts of the city, they don't see the effect of those cuts. If you live near Central Park, if you live near Prospect Park, whatever your lifestyle is, uh, you don't experience the injustice of these parks cuts. And uh, one thing that's really important is but to- But why not focus on that? Why not focus on the public monies that it would increase and be more equitably distributed instead of dipping into private donations? Uh, well, look, you know, I think we should walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> we need more city and state funding, absolutely, period. No proposal I make, mm -hmm. no conservancy obviates that need. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we need to create uh, more equity more quickly for kids and families who need it, and mm -hmm. also the political will to get more funding for these parks. Again, the fact that in the center of Manhattan, the major park uh, isn't one where is just crying out for more dollars, I think changes the political uh, perception of how important it is to increase funding. And Senator, for parks. quickly, what are you asking the participating parks, the underfunded parks, to contribute in this in your proposal? Uh, look, the underfunding parks should uh, get. Uh, community engagement and involvement, because we know that that also makes a big difference in parks. Uh, they need to be receptive to sharing of best practices and uh, other kinds of expertise from the contributing parks. Uh, the contributing parks, the big ones, need to contribute 20% of their operating budget and participate with this Neighborhood Parks Alliance that's going to target those parks in need that serve those kids and families who most need them. All right, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The political headlines came fast this past week. The death of New Jersey Senator Frank Lautenberg and Governor Christie's appointment of his Attorney General Jeff Chiesa to temporarily hold the seat took top billing. But there are still two special elections to come in New Jersey. The mayor's race is in full swing in New York City. And the scandals continue to swirl as the legislative session ends in Albany this month. With all that, it's hard to know where to start the conversation about politics. So we asked Alfred Doblin to join us. He's the editorial page editor of The Record, part of NorthJersey.com, and a longtime observer of all things political on both sides of the Hudson River. Alfred, welcome back. Thank you. Now, Alfred, have New York and New Jersey become uh, the paradise of political junkies and the purgatory of, if not the hell, of ordinary people? Well, I don't know about the, the hell part. Um, although a lot of ordinary people probably feel it's been hell for a long, long time. Um, but certainly the political folks are having a field day, uh, I think right now more in New Jersey than in, than in New York. Um, but it's a glorious time to be following politics. Was Governor Christie's decision to hold a special primary for the senatorial race to replace Senator Lautenberg in August and the election in November the smartest or the dumbest move he could have made? People fall on both sides of that. I think it was the smartest political move he, he made. You know, and, and I, Why? Well, looking at the court situation in New Jersey, I mean, Lautenberg became a U.S. senator the second time around because the courts decided that a, a deadline, which by the virtue of deadline means that it, you're dead and there's no <laughs> do not resuscitate order, didn't matter. Right. So that he was able to replace Bob Torricelli because Bob Torricelli was going to lose. Right. Um, at the last minute. Now, with that kind of history from the state mm -hmm. courts, it's unlikely that had Christie said, we'll wait till 2014, that if the Democrats challenge that decision, 
um, that he would have won. So he would have lost that. So then mm -hmm. he has a, definitely has an election in November, which he didn't want. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't want it in November, though, because he doesn't want Corey, the likely Democratic nominee, Cory Booker, to be on the same ballot. Why not? He wants to win huge. Uh -huh. It's not enough to win big. So he thinks he if, Co if Cory Booker's on the ballot, more Democrats will come and vote for his opponent? Yes, and more Democrats are going to vote for his opponent than a lot of Democrats think, because there are more Democrats in New Jersey, yeah. and they're going to right. vote that way. But I think the other thing to take note of in New Jersey is that there's a little bit of silence by some of the more powerful Democrats also. And, you know, there are people who want Barbara Bono to lose, and they're not Republicans, they're Democrats, because they really are looking at who can we run in 2017 when Chris Christie's not on the ticket. Right. So you've got to always look a couple elections right. ahead. Right. As you know, um, Alfred, um, a lot of people are saying that despite New Jersey's reputation for corrupt politics, that the legislators in Trenton are looking like maybe a gathering of the, f of the founding fathers compared to their compatriots in Albany. What do you say? Um, they got better teeth. <laughs> uh, you know, in, 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 uh, I guess in, in New York, there's less scrutiny on what goes on in Albany than there is in New Jersey. I mean, I think the, the media in New Jersey, because it's a smaller state and because it's a different kind of environment without, without New York City being the, the driver, um, Albany can sort of do what it wants, and it's done what it's, want, what it's wanted for a long time. Now we're seeing these huge corruption scandals, which are making people uncomfortable. We're seeing a lot of Democrats scrambling to become mayor, which is confusing. Um, there is no clear, uh, Christine Quinn has been considered the sort of inevitable Democratic candidate, but not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. So in that lack of clarity, there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of confusion. And, and let's talk about the mayor's race. Is there any possibility that come November, we will all be surprised about the outcome of that race? Anything is possible. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when James Buckley became the, the senator for this state. And, and people would not have expected James Buckley to be the U.S. senator, but two more popular candidates sort of fought each other out, and mm -hmm. that happened. So anything, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And Wiener's entry into the race? You know, all obvious jokes aside, I mean, I think it's interesting that there are no, you know, there's always a third or a fourth or a fifth act in, in politics. I would be surprised if he gains any real... Mm -hmm. you know, real traction. You mm -hmm. know, I would just say that um, I, would, I would be surprised. All right. Well, Alfred, thank you so much. You're welcome. New York is filled with architectural treasures, and to protect and preserve its historic buildings, the city passed the Landmarks Preservation Law in 1965. To get ready for the 50th anniversary of that legislation, a new group, the NYC Landmarks 50 Advisory Committee, is starting a series of events throughout the five boroughs and adding its support to programs like the Cultural Medallion Program, which honors individuals who have contributed to New York's history. Last month, Landmarks 50 members helped unveil the newest medallion at the former home of jazz legend Miles Davis. Lovers of jazz gathered here today in a place where history happened at 312 West 77th Street to honor and to celebrate the legendary jazz trumpeter and one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century, Miles Dewey Davis III, at the site of his residence from 1960 to 1983. Yes. Oh, it would be fair to say that history happened here. It was in this basement room behind us that was his music studio. And there he created Kind of Blue, the best-selling jazz record ever. Many of the people who play today played with him, performed with him, created with him right in that room. All of whom who have gone on to really illustrious careers it's clear that they had a really intense relationship and the deepest respect for his transformational contribution to music. And they were part of it. I joined his band when I was about 30 in, in the 70s. And um, just so happy to have known this great man. As an artist myself, when you're around great artists, that helps to rub off on you, and it, it teaches you how to study, how to how to learn things. And just just being around him was just such a great treasure.
Well, Miles Davis's art is always high quality and Miles Davis's person is always cool. He stands for high quality and coolness. This is where it happened. I mean, why do you go to the pyramids? You go to ancient Egypt, you go to Egypt now. You go to Miles Davis's existence, you go to 312 West 77th Street. This is what makes New York, New York. People walk along the street. They come from all over the world to see not only our diverse architecture, there's a reason that people are always looking up and down and sideways, but to see our visual and performing arts, our commerce, our industry, our literature, actually the special spirit and bounce that New Yorkers have. And I think Landmarks Buildings help do that, and I hope Keep walking with another bounce in your step. Whole neighborhoods in New York are landmarks, and none is more famous than the village. Greenwich Village is the subject of a new book by John Straussbaugh, who takes on its legends and history in The Village. 400 years of beats and bohemians, radicals and rogues, a history of Greenwich Village. John, welcome. Thank you very much. Now, John, how was Greenwich Village born? How did it come to be? Back when uh, New Amsterdam, when New York City was New Amsterdam, was a tiny little settlement down at the southern tip of Manhattan, Greenwich Village was one of the places you went to escape in the summer from the heat, uh, from yellow fever and cholera. And gradually, it became a permanent, like a suburb of New York City. Now, you write about the golden age mm -hmm. of Greenwich Village. What was that golden age? It, it was uh, uh, in the years leading up to World War I. It bloomed as, as an art neighborhood and as a bohemian neighborhood. And they did tremendous amounts of work to bring modern art, modern literature, modern theater to America. And the, between World War I and the Red Scare, that all kind of dissipated. What are some of the names apart. associated with that uh, period? Just, I mean, how long do you have? It, it, <laughs> Not too long. <laughs> it's amazing how many. Yeah. But at that point, you had uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Theodore Dreiser, Eugene O'Neill, uh, Margaret Anderson, who oh. was the first person to publish Ulysses oh. before it was published in Paris. Just a, a huge number of people. Now, you also uh, write about... Uh, the village renaissance that yeah. happened right after World War II. Who and what was involved in that? Yeah, the Golden Age was prematurely named. Um, <laughs> and really, it's in the years after World War II through the 50s into the 60s that Greenwich Village just explodes as, as the epicenter of the avant-garde in America. And not just avant-garde in art, but in music, in theater, with off and off, off Broadway. You had Allen Ginsberg and the Beats. You had uh, Barney Rossett publishing Grove Press, which was way out on the edge. Village Voice was founded in the 50s. The folk music scene that attracted Bob Dylan got started then. And it just, on every front, they were pushing. And, and some of the great, uh, you know, mid-century uh, painters. Jackson Pollock, uh, de Kooning, all those folks were down there. It really was. Below 14th Street in Manhattan was mm. the center of the American avant-garde, and it made New York the art capital of the world. Now, how critical was the village to the birth of the gay rights movement nationally? Hugely. For a very long time, it had been a haven for gays and lesbians when and almost anywhere else in America, you were a very lonely misfit if you were a gay or a lesbian. You were... Um, not only in, uh, allowed to be who you were, but you were encouraged to be who you were for, you know, into the 1800s. By the 1960s, uh, the a sort of civil rights movement for gay rights had developed. In 1969, there was the big Stonewall Uprising, also known as the Stonewall Riot, where, and this was mostly younger gay guys and lesbians who were just sick of being pushed And, and you know, it's the first time reading your book, it was a three-day event, and not even a consecutive yeah. three days of, of rioting. The, the, and the third night was because they didn't like the way they were written about in the village, village voice, voice which, of all there, which is very friendly, to the, <laughs> usually. So that was the beginning of the of the. Absolutely. From then on, that's why the '70s is you know the big decade for for the gay liberation because of I, I really think because of Stonewall, it excited everybody and incited everybody around the country. Now the '70s was pretty dismal for for New York City as a whole. How yeah. was it for the village? It was actually, for all of downtown Manhattan, it was actually a pretty good time. As rough as it was, because... That's when I moved there, by the way. There you go. <laughs> and so you remember. Yeah, and, sure. and because the city services were so bad and the city kind of wasn't paying attention, there was a lot of free or cheap space to like do your little theater things in. You could throw on a play for $17 and stuff you dragged out yeah. of a dumpster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Artists could have huge spaces there for a while because nobody was paying attention. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty great. And, and talk about the, the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was that the, the worst period 
for Greenwich Village? I, I think it's the darkest period. It, it sort of follows a pattern in the in the village that goes back to the 1700s when yellow fever and cholera and, and other kinds of plagues were, um, were coming out to the village. But it it was the it, everybody said at the time it was ground zero for AIDS yeah. at least on the East Coast, and it devastated the village. Now you make an interesting connection that I'd never thought of uh, between the, the AIDS epidemic in the village. And, and the transformation of the real estate. Talk about yeah, it. Yeah, you know, it's not the only reason that the village, uh, that the real estate changed and the village became this magnet for millionaires now, not misfits, but it's one of the big ones. Um, because, you know, the, the, the population of the village, at least the gay population of the village, was decimated, literally decimated. And a lot of other people moved out. They just, it was, it had become a death zone and no one wanted to be there mm. anymore. And as folks were moving out, the real estate people were starting to move the bankers and lawyers and, and doctors in. And, you know, of course, when that happens, the rents go up, the sale prices go up. So is the village in any form still uh, a cultural engine for the city? Um, I, I think you'd have to say no, not at this point. It, it's been declared dead as a cultural center many times in the past, so maybe it'll come back. But I, I, the real estate has to change for it to come back. Artists and cultural people and intellectuals need cheap places to live and work. All right, John, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Among New York City's greatest tourist attractions are its many art museums and galleries, but art is truly everywhere in our region. So come with us now to upstate New York, courtesy of Binghamton Station, WSKG, to the studio of bronze sculptor, Gary Weissman. and I make classical bronze sculptures. They're very traditional. The Greeks are a very big influence and also the Italian Renaissance is a very big influence. I don't tend to look at what's going around me. I tend to look back in terms of influences historically. We traveled to Italy, oh, maybe once a year for about three weeks, and we draw extensively, uh, nonstop, nine hours a day. I fill sketchbooks. The influences are used in the poses I do here. My main energies are going to be on on the classical nude. And I think there's, as far as public collections go, museums, outdoor situations, the nude is way blocked uh, in this country. You'll see a lot of them in Europe, although I don't know how contemporary. size pieces because it's just really maxing out the possibilities of architecturally what can a bronze structurally do. So they'll completely hover horizontally with no supports. What I'm working on now are female crucifixes and I don't really know why. Pieces have become a lot more narrative now. So that's kind of exciting. I'm sorry they're so tortured right now. You have to listen to these things. You know, you're listening to a drawing as it's happening, you're listening to a sculpture as it's happening. And I'm working on empowered kind of pieces which are based on Greek heroes with weapons.
It's kind of tricky business, it's very stressful. I started doing this in the mid 70s. When I do the pours, I'll pour 1,500 to 2,000 pounds in a day or so. During a pour, I have my ex-students come up from the Pennsylvania Academy in Philadelphia. There's an experiential rapport that I have with the metal. Would I do these things if they didn't sell? Yeah, I would. I think it's critical to always stay for me in a place of not knowing. I don't know. And finding an experiential connection to it through some form of non-intellectual sensation that will hold my intensity of focus. We're writing the story. I don't have a finite fixed ending. It's an evolution. We thank WSKG for that story, and we hope you'll take the time to visit at least one of our region's many studios, galleries, and museums this summer. We also want to thank you for sending in your photos of our Metro Focus bus and subway ads. We have an interactive map online at metrofocus.org where you can see the results. For Metro Focus, I'm Rafael Piroman. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by James and Merrill Tisch. Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Jody and John Arnhold, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the Nissan Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus was provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, 